Uh, so I wanted to start with some background to Verda and not assume that everybody knows who we are and what we do. I've had multiple conversations over the weekend and uh, some people don't know. So I, I live in a little bubble where I work from home and I just assume everyone knows what we do. Uh, so what I'm going to do is cover the results at a pretty high level of the two-year trial. Um, we have PhDs and researchers and medical doctors who go to technical conferences that really present this in depth. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time just reading slides to you, uh, but I'll kind of pick out the highlights from there. So what we've got is a five-year non-randomized perspective controlled study. Um, and this occurred in Lafayette, Indiana in conjunction with Indiana University Health System. So we recruited 465 participants uh, all the way back in August 2015, March 2016. So as you can see, we're presenting the two-year results that were collected about two years ago. So a lot has changed in the meantime. Uh, this is the first clinical trial that I've worked in. Uh, so my perception of science was you did a study and you wrote a paper and it was out in a week. And that's not true. Uh, this is actually a lot more work. So it's interesting when I read other studies now, I have a much different perspective on one, the amount of work that goes into it and, and probably the amount of suffering as well um, for the researchers and also the participants. Uh, so we had an active arm started with an N of 378. And I like this picture of humans. Um, if you're like me, you might fall into this trap of seeing a study with an N and forgetting that they're humans that are trying to do something in the real world. And it's probably difficult, even if the intervention might seem easy on the surface. Um, so I've worked with a lot of these people. Um, I'm actually directly a few of their coaches. And it, and it really is a journey. Um, and it's really an honor to work with them. Of the original 378, 262 were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And at the bottom, the average uh, years of having that diagnosis was 8.4 years. So we didn't go out and really kind of cherry pick newly diagnosed people who theoretically might be easier to treat. Um, and then we have the rest of the averages. Like one takeaway is that this is the way science is communicated in studies, but at the end of the day, no one is that average patient, right? There's no one that had the age of 54 with exactly that BMI, with exactly that starting weight, with exactly that time of diagnosis, and a 67% chance of being female. Um, so when we communicate these things, we're talking about group averages, and when that comes to an individual patient, um, they're kind of perspective in what might happen for them, but not necessarily always predictive, right? So kind of what we do, so we have two sources of innovation. So we have continuous remote care and the actual clinical protocol. Um, and it's the, it's the combination of these two which really are kind of like an exponential factor, right? There are practitioners who use similar protocols in a bricks and mortar clinic, right? Um, but as far as trying to scale to really what's an epidemic level, how many bricks and mortar individual practitioners would just America need much less India, China, the rest of the Western world, right? So the way that we see a good solution is through technology of continuous remote care and leveraging that platform um, to personalize care and coach care, but also provide better service. And so the typical experience for our patients before they came to us was they have a primary care, they may have an endocrinologist, right? Maybe you see your primary care every six months, maybe you can see your endocrinologist once or twice a year right? And everything that happens in the meantime, you're kind of on your own. You know, you can call the office, you might get a call back. Um, so we really want to change that, that paradigm there and provide, you know, almost real-time care. You know, you log your blood sugar, we see it. You have a question, we see it. We do sleep, right? So if you text me at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm not going to respond. Um, on that side, so it's the combination of these two. And then the clinical protocols, medication management, we are licensed to practice medicine in 50 states, right? Uh, we're not just prescribing a low carb diet and saying, hey, go good luck, right? Um, people on powerful diabetes medications, there is a significant safety risk for adopting a low carb diet without medical supervision. 
So here how's, here's how it kind of all looks in a graph. So we start with the patient, obviously. Um, so they go through a pretty, pretty lengthy enrollment process. Um, I think last year I fielded a question like, how do you help unmotivated people? I still don't have an answer to that. Um, you have to sign up and you have to do a phone call and you have to get some labs. So to even get in the door, you had to show some motivation for doing this. Um, so this is Wilma. Um, I still haven't met her in person. I said that last year. Um, she's a very nice lady. She's in a lot of our testimonial videos you see over here. Uh, so Wilma signs up. She's assigned a health coach. This is Catherine. Uh, the phone in the middle is the chat stream. So literally, there's no limit. She could talk to Catherine as much as she wants, truly about anything, right? At the beginning, it's a lot of education. People need the plan. Like, what do I eat? I have no idea what to eat, right? Um, so that can happen in pretty much as real time as the patient can respond. You know, if they're off work that day and you want to have a conversation all day, it is completely possible. Uh, we do also do phone calls and video calls. So when a new patient enrolls, my first communication is not sending them a lengthy text message. Uh, it consists of, hey, let's schedule a phone call and a video call so we can get to know each other and start to build a relationship um, there. The patient also has a video call with the physician. It, you know, in a, in a technical medical sense, this is called an HMP, a health and physical. This would be the first time you meet a new doctor. Here it's going to happen over video. Um, doctor basically is getting the health answering any questions that the patient has, not only about the treatment, but any other things. Um, and then the physician and health coach talk regularly. This is Dr. Jeff Stanley. I literally talk to him every day that I'm working. Uh, so that, that communication truly does happen. Uh, the patient's going to get a starter kit for biomarker tracking. It's kind of a fancy word for saying we want you to test your glucose and your ketones. We send a cell phone enabled scale. Uh, it's kind of neat technology. You're going to do those things, and we're going to ask you to do them consistently to a certain standard that the doctor has prescribed um, on that side. Some other things come in the kit, like you know, basic nutrition advice, cheat sheet, easy, quick reference things. Not everybody wants to go to an app every time they have a question. right? It's easy to leave a one-page laminated sheet of yes, no, simple nutrition choices. Um, inside the app also, we have a resource center. Uh, Patients are pretty handy, right? In the age of Google, you know, we're, we're pretty good at investigating and researching things. You know, some people like to go find stuff before they ask a question. So not everything needs to be routed to the coach. There are a lot of uh, recipes in there, ideas, articles, blogs, things are not completely public facing. Um, all those types of things are always available. And then we have a patient community. So this is, I've been at Verta over three and a half years. This is why they brought me in. I have a background in not only health coaching and sport coaching, um, but also addiction recovery. I started in 12-step groups when I was 21 years old. I've ran Facebook groups for both addiction support and also health and wellness topics. Verta said, hey, we want to have an online patient community where they can interact. And I'm like, I can do that. Um, I don't run it like a 12-step group, because obviously it's not a 12-step group. But there are some principles that apply for 12-step that I think fit really good with any kind of support model. And I'd say the primary foundation is that we want to share our experience and strength and hope with other people. right? So that's sharing wins. right? That's very motivating, uh, especially if you're brand new and you see all these people doing great. But it's also sharing, uh, we call it, well, we have a day for it. We call it Fallible Friday. <laughs> it's like, hey, this is the day that we're all going to admit all the ways that we messed up right? and be honest. So that, one, the person suffering in silence that thinks they're the only one, quote, failing, isn't alone, right? And then we're going to support each other and encourage each other to keep sharing openly and honestly, because we all have to work through all of our problems together, right? If we are isolated at home, thinking we're the only one suffering, and maybe our only resource is our coach, and maybe we're not telling our coach, the chances of success go down quite a bit. So I was making a joke. Uh, I was like, can I get through the presentation without saying ketosis? And then I realized I put a slide with ketosis on it. Um, I kind of threw this in in light of the current diet war thing that's going on that I just kind of really don't understand. Um, 
I mean, I don't care what anybody eats, right? If you have a medical problem, maybe there's a, there's a correct way to eat. Um, I also kind of don't know what a, quote, keto diet is. People think it's macros and certain types of foods. And, you know, the way I look at it is it's completely different for every person. There are some general underlying principles that tend to work for most people, and it's good to have a starting point. But from there, uh, it's really whatever works for you that you can do that helps you lower your blood sugar and produce some amount of ketones, right? And so everybody in this room, you could all try a stock keto diet, and you might all get wildly variable results. But you might all start at the same place, and we could make adjustments, and then you could all kind of get to a similar place biologically. Um, so generally, it's carbohydrate restriction, right? If we know what keto is, we typically start at 30 grams a day. Seems to work for most people. Um, but some people can eat more, and some people need to eat a little less. We just don't know. We have to start somewhere, right? And that's really the individualization of the whole program, right? It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, really, in anything in health and medicine um, on that side. It's highly personalized. Also, not everybody can afford all different kinds of foods. I don't shop at Whole Foods. Most of my patients don't either, right? How can you do this at Walmart? How can you do this at Costco? How can you do this at Safeway, at Kroger, right? How can you do this at Burger King, right? Um, Culture-wise, too, religion, um, omnivore, vegetarian. You can eat a vegan, ketogenic diet. Maybe not the easiest thing in the world, but if you're super motivated and you like to cook, it's certainly possible. So we're result driven, and I would say diet agnostic, right? It's what works for the person in front of me in their preferences, but also their environment and any kind of constraints, um, whatever that might be. It has to work for them. Education, problem solving. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes there's, there's a few meal delivery services that are okay. Uh, meal replacement bars. Right, sometimes you're just on the run and you can't get real food. Hey, that's all right. You know, we have a solution for that. Uh, you know, eat delicious whole foods. We prefer that uh, until satisfied, no calorie counting. I think the default setting is what's the minimum amount we can ask someone to do and see if we get results. We could always add stuff on. Like, why start with the hardest program in the world and see if we can get 1% to follow? We'll start with the easiest thing with the least amount of requirements and have you take a run at it for 30 days. And if you need to adjust, we make the adjustment, right? When we talk about it being a lifestyle and not a diet, I'm looking at working with this person. Like, I want you to eat this way in 20 years. I am not in a rush to get you to eat this way in two weeks and watch you stop doing it in 60 days and then start over again. So we take it slow. Um, patients usually like to go faster, though. Faster results are better. It's motivating. Um, and it's not zero carb. I don't know if we've actually got that complaint before. Um, but we do recommend five daily servings of vegetables. Uh, at certain times, people add on nuts and berries. Uh, we do try to systematize at certain times when the results are good and people are willing and possibly wanting to, and we think there's a good chance of success that they can, uh, that they can eat more carbs, right? I think long-term success, the more options we have, is generally better. But there's a right time to do it. There's a right way to systematically test adding these foods. Um, and that ties back into the biomarker logging and also how we feel. Hey, you want to add some berries in? We can systematically check your glucose and see what your individual response is, right? Um, we don't just, hey, day 30, you can eat berries, because not everybody can. All right, so at a high level at two years, so what we saw was diabetes reversal of 55%. And that's defined as patients who have an HbA1c under 6.5 without diabetes-specific medications. Too much coffee this morning. Um, there, there's definitions of reversal and remission from the American Diabetes Association, so we follow those. Um, there's also the definition of what diabetes is as defined as uh, hyperglycemia with an A1c of 6.5. So we go with those. Uh, medication eliminations, so 67% of all diabetes-specific prescriptions were discontinued over the course of that two years. And weight loss at the end of two years was 12%, um, so again, an average. 
diabetes specifications is basically everything except metformin because um, there are indications for metformin for other things, right? So here's how the charts look. So on the left, we have blood sugar changes, HbA1c for two years. So we have the usual care observational arm, and then in blue are the patients who actually did the program. Um, the usual care arm, they were in the same health system, in the same city, and they were doing something, at least seeing a diabetes educator. Um, the American Diabetes Association has actually adopted low carb as a potential therapeutic tool. And in the city of Lafayette, it's pretty small. And if you're familiar with Dr. Hallberg, she's pretty famous there. So I would not suspect that some of our 87 people in the usual care arm at some point get recommendations to do low carb. So that'll be interesting to see. Uh, but we don't, I don't think we have a report of any of them. What we did have is we had people drop out of the usual care arm when they could pay to join Verda. <laughs> so they left the trial, being the control group, it paid to do what everybody else was doing, which to me is success. Um, so what we saw was average starting A1C of 7.5 at one year at 6.2. And then at two years, it goes back up a little bit to 6.6. .6. So what are some explanations? Um, one is we look at medication spend. Um, so medication cost goes down at two years. Pretty certain that's not, become, not because pharmaceuticals got cheaper. Um, people want to get off medications. Um, I don't know if we'd classify ourselves as aggressive. I think we, we do the correct thing for the patient for safety and shared decision making. Um, people want to try to do this without meds. I still haven't met that patient who just wants to take the meds. I think it's a very cynical view. Um, I, I assume there's, there's providers and practitioners that see that. I, I just haven't met that person. Um, I also haven't seen that unmotivated person who doesn't care about their health and doesn't care what they weigh or what their A1C is. Everybody cares. Um, so one explanation is we could see an increase in A1C simply by deprescribing more meds, right? I think another one is, hey, see, people didn't follow the program is great. I don't think that's unrealistic, um, especially with what we see in other trials. Uh, here's the weight loss graph chart. So the dash line is clinically significant weight loss. Um, someone's decided 5% was clinically significant. So if you run a weight loss trial and you get more than that, you're basically doing awesome. Um, so as you see, it went down to about 14% at the end of year one, and we're at 12%. So people take the weight off. Uh, some people add a little bit back on. 75% of patients lost more than 5%, and 49% of patients lost more than 10%. Of course, we have outliers both ways. We have some people who didn't lose any weight, and we have people that lost over 100 pounds um, on that side. So what do we see in other trials? Um, similar trends, right? So then I, I look at it from a coaching perspective and go, we did pretty good compared to some other type of interventions. The TAY study was a carbohydrate restriction study, uh, direct and wing, very low calorie, and look ahead was intensive, so there was nutrition and uh, I think exercise, right? We all kind of see the same thing. So are we all validating human nature and that we need to put more effort into supporting people with behavior change? I, 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 we, well, me personally, I think we collectively say yes. Yes, more, more needs to be put in this. It's very interesting if we can figure out what the perfect diet is. But at the end of the day, if nobody can do the perfect diet, what's the point of having it, right? You know, if we have a pretty good plan that works for most people and we can get world class at helping them do it, I think that's a lot better use of our time there. Um, here's some additional outcomes. So a decrease in metabolic syndrome rate, insulin resistance as measured by HOMA IR, uh, body weight we already talked about. We saw a pretty good decrease in C-reactive protein and white blood cells, so markers of inflammation. Decrease in triglycerides and increase in HDL. And then improvements in uh, liver function. We actually published a paper on a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, so that was a really good one. 
Um, so there are other benefits besides just reduction and control in blood glucose. Uh, we published a cardiovascular paper that showed improvement in, I think, 22 of 26 markers for cardiovascular risk. That's, a, that's kind of a contentious topic these days. So we picked 26 markers. If you prefer LDL, you can look at that. If you prefer any of the other markers or a calculator or a mix and a match and a ratio, uh, you can plug all our numbers in and you can kind of make your own decision about what you think the outcome is. We think it's helpful. Um, on that side. So I would talk about coaching and then um, you know, how do we actually work with people. And I meant to print out what I was going to say and I didn't. So I'm going to read off my phone to at least keep me going. So we talked about plans and diet plans. So whether it's health coaching, nutrition, sports, business, education, I think we're driven to want the perfect plan. Right? There's this illusion of there, if I get this perfect plan, I'm just magically going to get whatever's at the end of the rainbow. Right? And what I've come to learn is there is no perfect plan, first of all. Um, I think it's interesting to put effort and time into trying to develop a perfect plan. I don't think that's a waste of time. I'm glad people are researching more in biology and uh, metabolism and figuring all these things out. Right. I think going from a plan that's 90% good to 95% is great. Um, but at the end of the day, if we have the perfect plan and no one can do it, it's totally worthless, right? It, I mean, I, I don't care. I mean, I could download Usain Bolt's 100 meter sprinting program for myself. Am I going to be in the Olympics? No, right? So, one of my favorite philosophers has this saying. This is the famous philosopher Mike Tyson. This, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? And I think we've all been there. We may, hopefully we haven't all been punched in the mouth. Um, but we've all had this great plan. You know, we grew up, we had the elementary school plan, and we had the high school plan, and maybe we had the college plan, and maybe we had the master's and PhD plan. If we played sports, we had the training program, we had the coach. Uh, you know, our parents maybe had a plan for us. Plan, plan, plan. You get a job, you have your career plan, you know, nutrition. Yeah. Here's, your, here's your diet plan, right? You want to get a trainer. Here's your plan. We have plans everywhere, right? Um, and I think a lot of coaches, and I fell into this trap, especially in sports, when I first started coaching, is I spent all my time trying to figure out how to design plans. And then I'd give them to people, and then they wouldn't do them. It, like, okay, so obviously I'm not paying attention to normal people, right? Like, but I did the same thing. I had plans my whole life, and people gave me great plans and great advice, and I had multiple coaches and mentors and teachers and professors who were trying to teach me these lessons of, you're the problem, not the plan. You can't follow the plan because you need to develop some other skills. Right? You don't need more information. You don't need more education. You know, whatever's going on in your life and in your head, that's what's stopping you from following the plan. Um, so that's what we see here, right? I don't fault people. Yes, you need a plan, and preferably you need a plan that might get you where you want to go with your goals. Um, but at a certain point, when you have the education and you know the plan and you know what to do, we have to develop other skills. And I specifically work still with clinical trial patients and patients that have been doing this a year longer, because the question is not, what do I eat? The question is, I know what I should be eating, I don't know why I'm not doing it. And that is a, that is a question that is not answered with another meal plan, right? So last year I talked about defining a purpose and meaning for doing what we're doing, right? I think the deeper level purpose, the better. It's a, why do you want to join Verda? I want to get off medications. Excellent goal. I want to lose weight. Excellent goal. Why do you want to get off medications? Well, they're unhealthy for me. Correct. Right? Um, why do you want to lose weight? Well, because that makes me more healthy. I'm not, I'm not getting to the why yet. Right? What do you, why do you really want to do this? And eventually we end up with the question, why do you want to be healthier? People get, it's, a it's kind of a stumper, right? Because it's kind of one of those we want to go, duh. Like, who wants to be unhealthy? But really the answer below that is purpose, 
right? Is it your kids, right? Is it your vocation? Uh, for me, it's being of service to others with no expectation, and that's my definition of love, right? When I'm healthier, I can be of service to our patients without any expectations and hold space for them and really love them and help them. When I'm healthy, I'm a better spouse. I'm being of service to my wife. I'm present in the relationship, right? No expectations is harder in a marriage, but it's practice. I have kids, right? When I'm healthier, I'm present with my kids. I'm being of service to them, right? Whatever that might look like. So when we can get people down to this level, um, I think that's, when, that's really when we have something to tap into, right? So when you walk in the office on Tuesday morning and there's donuts, and you're texting me, I don't know, I got these cravings. I like donuts too. Um, and I'm putting myself in their position. I'm going, you know, hey, are those really going to serve you to reach your goals? Because donuts in my face are a very strong emotional drive, right? I've been doing this for six years. I will eat a donut. Um, if we can have that conversation, if they can get that gap in the space, right, where they say, hey, this is not really going to serve my health. This is not going to help me serve and reach my goals. And this means I'm not going to be more present for or more available or tap into what my real underlying purpose for doing this is. I think that's typically enough emotional pull. Am I going to pick donuts over my wife? Am I going to pick donuts over my kids? It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, right? But the chances are we're not going to do that. Uh, so some more practical things. Not everybody wants to do this, right? We have a purpose. We set standards. Standards could be habits. They could be behaviors. Purpose could be meaning. We tend to come in with goals, and we build this foundation on goals. And sometimes we reach goals, and then we lose our foundation. And we got to keep, cycle, keep cycling goals, and eventually we run out of goals. Um, so I like to build on purpose. If you get a purpose deep enough, that underlies any kind of goal you want to do anywhere in life, right? Um, so one other thing that I think, well, I don't think anything on that slide. Blue sky. All right, so one other thing I work on, so I call these the five C's. So people typically, here's the two things people tell me they want after plans. Coach, I need motivation and I need willpower. I have no idea how to give you that. Motivation, if it's not internal, if it's externally, it's driven by Rewards and punishments, carrots and sticks. I have no reward I can give you greater than your purpose and your health, period. Even if I gave you money, like I got to give you money for the rest of your life, right? Great analogy. I want my kids to do chores. I got to tie a purpose to it that he's serving the family and we love him and this is great being part of our community. Or I can give him $5 and I have to give him $5 for the rest of his life, right? Rewards are fine. They're short-term incentives. We work for money, you know, our companies do it, um, but I, I can't reward, and I'm certainly not gonna punish a patient. Like, I have no sticks, right? And willpower, we could debate if free will even exists. Uh, if you've meditated at all, you realize you, you don't really create most of your thoughts, uh, so that's debatable. So I just find motivation and willpower tracks are kind of like dead ends. You know, we just, we never go anywhere. So whenever I hear willpower motivation, I move to what I call the five C's. We want to work on commitment, which is actually different than a motivated decision. A lot of people confuse a motivated decision to do something with commitment, right? So I wanted to learn to play the ukulele. I had free lessons from an expert who's a friend online. My mom bought me the ukulele for Christmas. No barriers. I'm motivated. I'm going to do it with my son. I have this vision, this fantasy that we're gonna be like playing in a jam banjo band and we do lesson one and it's hard and he quits and I quit. We had a motivated decision, we had no commitment. First sign of adversity, we give up, right? <laughs> That's the difference. Um, so commitment is an act, right? These are also things that I think we wanna change our self narrative and we, we would all rather label ourselves these things then I'm not the person that can stick with anything. I'm not the person that's consistent. I'm certainly not compassionate with myself. Uh, woe is me, everything's always terrible, right? So we have this self-narrative, maybe we've failed in other things. Um, those are factually true, but what we wanna do is try and change that self-narrative to some of these things that I think we all show at times, 
and that we'd all rather label ourselves as, right? And I really think we're searching for transformational outcomes, but we have to transform as a person to get them. If we get transformational outcomes without personal transformation, we lose them, right? We can certainly, we've probably all gotten outcomes without being a better person, but we don't hold on to them. We, the, the lottery winner, right? <laughs> they blow all the money. Because they're the same person, they just have $10 million now, right? They didn't have that chance to transform. Um, so we want to transform as a person in the process. Consistency, it starts with a C, so it worked better than discipline and habits. Uh, <laughs> you could give a whole talk on habits. I'd recommend James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, uh, Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, if you don't want to read a book, Simon Marshall has a one-hour course that's designed for health coaches, but honestly, any human that takes it, it's called Nudge Tactics for Health Coaching. And Simon's super engaging. I actually watched it three times because I had to pay attention. Uh, compassionate curiosity is really like, we don't know what's going to happen. It, when you sign up, I got group averages. I, I don't know how you're going to do. And I'm going to be honest with you, right? But you might do better than the group average. I don't know. We have to get to know each other and start working through it. Um, and I want you to stay curious, right? That helps us through the fall over period, right? If we fall over and it's all of a sudden, woe is me, and Eeyore comes out and I've failed at everything I've ever done in my life, it's going to be a tough road. Um, the, I put them together because compassion is necessary for curiosity, right? We probably beat ourselves up. I mean, even people that are successful, I mean, it's like an epidemic of just not being compassionate to ourselves. And it, it really then courage, right? It's, this is hard. Everything's hard. Everything worth doing is hard. If it's easy, you don't need commitment, consistency, and courage if it's easy. Like, sitting on my couch is easy. It's, I mean, I don't need to show any commitment to do that. That's like my default setting. NFL's on Sunday, I'm on the couch, right? There's no effort there. Um, so everything worth doing is hard, and everything that we value is hard. Um, and we're going to be afraid, right? We have the uncertainty. We don't know how it's going to go. We've never done this before, right? Our brain is seeking certainty, right? That's the brain's job. It looks out, and it's like, Oh, look at this situation. Well, here's something that happened in 1988 that was like 8% similar. That's how it's going to go. And that's just not how it works, right? So it's kind of staying open. Um, and we're going to have fear. Right? Anytime we try anything new, anytime we fail, anytime we fall down, anytime we struggle, we could say they're all learning experiences, right? But if we don't get back up and show courage, then we didn't really learn anything from them, right? We just stay down. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big role of the coach is, when a patient shows any of these, I tell them. Because I have to reinforce that they're developing the skill, right? And they have to be recognized. Yes, I want to recognize you for weight loss. Yes, I want to recognize you for getting off medication. Yes, I want to recognize you for excellent glucose and correct choices. But I also want to recognize you for all of these things of how you're transforming the self and becoming a better person. Because when these happen and these become our self-narrative, the chances of maintaining the outcomes exponentially increase. And the last one I talked about a little before was community. You just, you got to get out with people like you, right? Why do we come to this conference? And we can watch all these YouTube videos, right? And like, I didn't, I didn't need to fly here. I mean, I had to talk, but you know, it's like we come here to meet other people and connect and be in community. Right? Uh, I came from 12 step groups, right? Like, if I had to quit using drugs sitting in my basement thinking I'm the only guy using drugs, like, what are my chances? Like, that's a miserable existence. I certainly didn't want to go to a group and sit with a bunch of other men and tell them, you know, like, I don't want to listen to these guys. But after a while, you kind of get there and you realize we're all very similar. We have similar problems. We have similar hopes, fears, and dreams, right? And when we feel not alone and we can share those things with other people and get support, I find that very powerful. Uh, I never got to the campfire slide. Um, so there's all my contact information. Um, yeah, if we have any questions. The books and resources that you mentioned really quickly. Oh, the habits ones? 
Yeah, so James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits. And if you like podcasts at all, I'll just be honest, I haven't read either of these books, but I've heard James Clear on like eight podcasts. And after you listen to about 12 hours of somebody talk about their book, like I'll probably buy it just to give them money. Uh, you know, it's like it's a, it's a it's a challenging thing for authors, right? That's how they make their money, but they have to market it by going on a two-hour podcast and telling all their information. Uh, so, Atomic Habits by James Clear, and you, you honestly could find him on a podcast and get the gist. Um, and then Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. So, our CEO Sami Inkinen read it, and he's got this. Uh, deal where if he reads a book and he likes it, he'll pay for all the employees to buy it. So I always buy every one of them because he's a smart guy and he's a CEO. And I'm like, well, I want to read whatever he's reading. Plus, if I bump into him, I want to talk to him and show him I read it because it looks good for me, right? Uh, like, hey, I'm doing what you said uh, on that side. So Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. He's been on some podcasts, but I'm about halfway through. And I would say that's definitely worth a read. It is a very interesting book. And you can't get out of it anything from a podcast interview. Um, and then the online course is by Simon Marshall, and that's called Nudge Tactics for Health Coaches. Um, and it's kind of like if you've done a Coursera course, and, but it's way better. I've done a bunch of Coursera courses, and um, Simon's was about an hour. Here's my thing with Coursera. I start doing it. I start playing on the internet. I'm doing like 87 other things, and I'm kind of like paying attention because I figure I can pass the test and get the certificate. And then Simon starts, and five minutes in, I'm going, I have to stop because I have to actually pay attention to this. Not because I need to to pass the quiz at the end to get the certificate, but because the information is so good and well presented. Um, and it's an hour, so I've watched it three times. Um, and Simon lives in San Diego, but he had to be in Boulder because his wife's a professional triathlete. So we, we were kind of hoping he would be here. Uh, great guy. Uh, he's been on some podcasts with Chris Kelly from Nourish, Balance, Thrive. Uh, he works with them. Um, and he wrote a book called The Brave Athlete uh, with his wife. Um, so I've purchased that, not read it yet. I'm really interested in working with athletes and high school kids. Um, so I think that'll be good. Is that it? Okay, cool. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. That was amazing. Um, it's actually a big part of the uh, paleo community to be uh, healthy, it's not just via diet. And uh, you had mentioned, uh, you seem to look at the concept of, um, of willpower yeah. and uh, you know some of those rah-rah um, messages we get from people uh -huh. that aren't necessarily very helpful. Uh, and I have a second question, but could yeah. you address how you look differently at uh, the way you helped to motivate people? I think your whole talk was quite quite a bit different. Yeah, so I would, I guess I'd clarify that motivation's not bad, right? And willpower's certainly not bad. Um, I just, they're not really tappable resources as far as, and, and I do this, if you talk to some of the high school kids I coach, they'd be like, he's the least inspirational coach we have ever worked with. And that's also, and I get fired up sometimes, so maybe that's not totally true. Um, but it's kind of, if we continually need repeat motivation, we have to keep going to the well, and we keep having to find outside reasons outside of ourselves. And I think it's a harder practice and a better practice to search in within for, you could call it intrinsic motivation. I prefer the word inspiration, because we always have access to ourselves, even though we don't feel we do. Um, and if we create that reconnection and relationship with ourselves and tap into that inspiration, we are not dependent on any external thing to fuel us. And that's, that's kind of the way, but it's a difficult practice. So I will motivate people because I need to use every tool available. So I, I do get calls, coach, I need some motivation. I'm not gonna like give them the spiel about inspiration, right? I'm gonna be like, let's jump on the phone. And then what I try to do is, I don't try to use the technique of motivating them. I try to be positive in my affect. And if we're on a video call, in my facial expression, and I'm really seeing it as, I, I, this might sound cheesy, but I'm trying to bring a ray, ray of sunshine into their life, right? And because I think with whether you believe in mirror neurons or not or whatever that is, if I'm smiling and I'm positive, th that that person's going to change a little bit um, versus if I get on a call and somebody's like 
and I mirror that, now what are we doing? You know, so I do that with kids. Like I show up every day and I'm consistent with my positive attitude. And I'm consistent with my positive talk and I'm consistent without punishing, without being critical, especially in groups. Now I will correct individually, um, those kind of things. So we don't want to, we don't want to not tell people when they're doing something wrong because that's not serving them. That's not love, right? But there's certain ways to do it to show that you still care. So it's kind of establishing the care first. If somebody makes a mistake, um, I kind of rambled into a second tangent there. Um, does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, actually, yeah. that that was amazing. You're helping me understand that, uh, and you even had the word compassionate up yeah. there with the curiosity. You're helping me understand that um, it looks like you're uh, evolving into a real uh, helpful and um, partnership uh, with your clients, yeah. helping them get better. Um, did you find through the years, and my last question yeah. then, uh, did you find through the years as you kind of, uh, as you matured as a man, yeah. uh, as well as, as a uh, teacher and a motivator, did you find that um, maybe there were, and I don't want to be, um, You're good. I, I don't know, the, the term toxic masculine, masculinity yeah, good, might yeah, have yeah. a that's kind of a new buzzword yeah. but did you find that you um recognize that some of that didn't work uh and so you were masculine enough yourself to say hey dude that being that blunt or mean or aggressive is not helping our clients yeah i um, i don't think any of our coaches coach that way but if you go to like a sport Right, I think it's it's a, it's an epidemic in sport, and there are certainly a group of of male coaches who are very public about trying to change that. Um, and you, you could call that old school. Um, you know, certainly punishing and yelling at people that works for short term compliance. If I if I want short term compliance with a kid, I'm guaranteed to get it by punishing and yelling at them. Right, I, I could do that with my kids, but what am I ensuring I'm not getting is learning and long-term behavior change, and I'm not improving our relationship at all. So I'm, I'm destroying trust and connection for this short-term outcome, right, that I'm forcing. And, and bosses can do that with employees. Spouses do it. It, it, it. It's just not, it's expedient in the short term. If it's an emergency and this place is on fire and I yell at you to get out, they, okay. But any other situation, if it's not a life and death emergency, I don't think really needs to be handled that way. And and I would, I've, I've certainly handled situations that way. And I don't know if that sometimes is our default nature. Um, but I try really hard. It's a, it's a, it's a constant practice. Um, but I think if the goal is always long term behavior change and improvement from a caring, loving place, then it just takes time. Yeah. Does that help? Great, thanks. Oh, yeah, that's, you're welcome. That's a great message. Yeah. 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 Thank you.